He also tells police that he does not want to see Jennifer or for her to visit the hospital under any circumstances. However, she discovers that he is woken up, so she quietly enters the room. She tells him that she's got accepted into university and asks him for $1,200. What? I know! <laughs> the audacity! He's just lost his wife, been in a coma, and she's like, I can have some money, Dad. What a bitch. <laughs> Welcome to the Compendium, an assembly of ways parental pressures can lead to deadly consequences. Well, it is hard work being a parent. And your experience on that is... Well, none, but I've seen parents and it looks quite hard. It does look hard. I feel so sorry for my friends who have got babies. And now we're at the age where they're having their second baby. I'm like, ah, sucker. I know. But yeah, I feel terrible. That's us booking a holiday. Waking up, Saturday afternoon, going to the gym, high-fiving each other as we get into the car and realise we have no kids. <laughs> <laughs> You're stuck at home, picking up custard out the carpet. Yeah, exactly. And by the sounds of things, it doesn't sound like it ends well. Deadly consequences this week. Foreshadowing for you parents out there. <laughs> if you're tuning in for the first time, I'm your host, Kyle Reesey, a man who definitely understands the importance of getting one story straight. And I'm your co-host, Adam Cox, and curious to know what did happen to that box of chocolate rounds that I had. Um, well, somebody like left the front door open and like a raccoon like came running in and they took the box of rounds and I said, hey, don't eat those. Those are Adam's. And then he left. So it's not my fault. <sighs> Always with the raccoon. <laughs> <laughs> so, Adam, what have you been up to this week since last week's episode on the Radium Girls? Have you been looking for your own radium infused jock strap to help you become more virile? That is a really weird choice of words I don't, that sounds horrible <laughs> what a bit of radium to get you all a bit excited a virile that, that's, virile yeah i mean there's going to come a point in your life where some person that you're courting might not be me i could die it's going to go oh you're quite virile for 75 <laughs> i'm going to start referring to you as virile please don't i'm going to make that happen move on let's move on <laughs> <laughs> um, how was my week? Um, it's been good, thank you. Um, the sun is shining and we went for cocktails at lunch. That was nice. We, we were ladies who lunch. Yeah. Well, um, speaking of virile, it's very loosely associated. But apparently scientists have discovered that kissing actually happened a thousand years earlier than they thought it originally started. Okay. What evidence have they got? For when kissing came about. Well, that's a weird... photographs? It's, um, not a photograph, but uh, a piece of art, I guess. Rob. Um, uh, I'll go into it. So apparently they thought that kissing started three and a half thousand years ago, but now they think it's four and a half thousand years ago. Um, and the reason they now think that is they found a clay tablet which displays two people, a man and a woman, and mm -hmm. it, it's an erotic scene from 1800 BC. And they're kissing. But the ellipse are touching. And so from that, they can now deduce that, oh, people kissed back then. Where was this found? Um, Southern Asia, I believe. Okay, yeah. wow. It's so weird that we kiss, right? Like, what other animals kiss? Like, cats will bump heads. They have different signs of yeah, affection. But is that kissing though it's kissing yeah who thought that was a good idea do chimpanzees and apes kiss i don't know not sure and then my um second story was a man was arrested for speeding but um can you guess what he did to try and get out of it he tried to flirt with the cop well he was traveling with his dog uh-huh and so as the oh no as the police officer came to obviously knock on his window, he swapped seats with his dog. My dog was driving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what did she say? So can you imagine it? We're like, I didn't do it as the dog. <laughs> That's like blaming your dog ate your homework. So yeah, when he was confronted, then he tried to run away. But I think he only managed to get like 18 meters before he was caught. Um, this was in a town called Springfield. 
Maybe it was Homer Simpson. Yeah, that sounds like <laughs> something that he would do, actually. Yeah, um, I thought that was pretty funny, trying to blame your speeding on your dog. Wow. So, you are listening to The Compendium, an assembly of fascinating and intriguing things. We are a weekly podcast where I tell Adam, my perpetually perplexed and infinitely inquisitive co-host, all about a topic that I think you will find both fascinating and intriguing. So, what are you serving us today? Well, funny you ask, because today we're hopping over the pond to Canada, where we see what a young Vietnamese woman called Jennifer Pan cooked up for us back in 2010. Now, the reason I picked this week's topic is because Jennifer's story tackles a stark and unsettling, tackles the stark and unsettling extremes of human deception and desperation, especially under the weight of like the oppressive family expectations and how this pressure can sometimes lead to unthinkable consequences. So my question for you is, what's the biggest pressure you've ever had? from your parents growing up? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Like taking out the bins for the bin man, emptying the dishwasher, keeping your room clean, anything like that? Any responsibilities? Saying the table, maybe? There you go. Actually, probably turning up for dinner on time. Oh, it's a big responsibility. What happened? What were the consequences if you didn't? Well, you'd get like a 10-minute warning that um, mum was about to dish up. And then you have another warning to say that she is dishing up. And then... The dinner's on the table and you're still not downstairs. It sounds like you lived in a family of gannets where like if you didn't eat quick, you didn't eat. Um, No, just make sure you're on time. Dinner's going to get cold. Okay, I can tell you now that this is nothing like Jennifer Pan's upbringing where the expectations on her to achieve high marks and excel in education was way more than just making sure you show up to dinner on time at seven o'clock on the dot so is is that a cultural thing because you mentioned vietnamese we'll get into that i mean it's quite typical of first second generation families to have to instill high or kind of parents to instill high expectations on their kids to excel and achieve because sometimes the reason why they've even come to the countries like Canada or the UK or America in the first place is because they want to take advantage of all those opportunities Mm -hmm. that they never got the opportunity to to get back in their home country. So those high expectations are sometimes like forced onto their children. But that's what today's story is all about. So shall we get into it? Let's get into it. So let's set the scene. On the 8th of November 2010, a 911 call is connected to the dispatch centre. Crackling through the line on the other end is the voice of a 24-year-old woman named Jennifer Pan, living in Ontario in Canada. She is all tied up. Her words are tumbling out in a frenzy of fear. A group of men have busted into her home, sending her entire world into chaos. Jennifer is shrieking into the phone. Her heart is pounding and she is telling the operator that intruders have dragged her parents down into the basement. Then all of a sudden, a series of disturbing sounds can be heard in the background. Bang, bang, bang. And then there might be another one bang, but I couldn't corroborate this. (laughs) But the 911 operator pauses and their voice cuts through the panic. He asks... Do you think those were gunshots? With a shaky voice, Jennifer stammers, I've never heard gunshots before. At least I don't think so. But maybe. I think that's what I heard. Jennifer then goes on to share the chilling account of how men had barged into her room, dragged her out and bound her to the staircase banister with a shoelace. Just then, a male's voice pierces the air. It's a raw, gut-wrenching wail. Filled with dread and fear, the operator is startled and asks, who is that? Jennifer, startled by the cry, directs her response to the source. Her words tumbling out in a rush. Dad, dad, it's okay. I'm on the phone to the police. And then we hear a wailing scream escaping out the front door, echoing into the silent street. It was at that moment that the police finally arrived at the scene. And as the sirens blared, the call ended abruptly, leaving everyone in a nerve wrecking suspense. So Adam, in today's episode of The Compendium, I am going to be telling you the story of Jennifer Pan and how the events we just recounted came to transpire. So, what do you think? From what I can 
understand. Someone has broken into her house. Someone's tied her up with a shoelace. Um, but And they've taken her parents down to the basement. Mm-hmm. We don't know why. She's on the phone to the police. Mm-hmm. So some burglary gone wrong. Um, that's what it sort of suggesting. Although why they would kill people, I guess we're about to find out. Well, I mean, from that 911 call, that's exactly... What it sounds like, right? Mm-hmm. A burglary gone. A burglary. A, bur- a burglary gone wrong. So let's find out what happened, right? Mm-hmm. So that night, three men had broken into the Pan's home. Bick, Jennifer's mother, had been watching TV downstairs, and Jennifer had been watching TV in her room. And Han, her dad, was upstairs getting ready for bed. Jennifer tells police that she hears a kind of commotion downstairs. She hears her mother's mother panically call her dad, and there's all of a sudden lots of footsteps. And at this moment, she knows something is going on. Petrified, she decides to stay in her room. She listens as the men forcibly demand money, and her parents are responding that they don't carry much cash, maybe just a little bit inside their wallets. She can tell that the men are becoming furious. Then she overhears them dragging her parents into the basement. Shortly afterwards, one of the men storms into her room and starts demanding money. Jennifer had saved up like $2,000, stashed away in her dresser. She hands this over immediately and she pleads with them to let her go be with her parents. But instead, they bind her to the staircase with a shoelace. Then she heard disturbing sounds of gunshots, four, possibly five, ring out in very close succession after which the sounds of the men are heard making their escape. In a desperate attempt, Jennifer manages to wriggle her hand into her pocket and grab her phone, and she dials 911. At this moment, the tragic reality hits her that her mother, Beck, could potentially be dead. Beck sustained a gunshot wound to her neck and to her head, and she dies instantly. Mm -hmm. Han, her dad, was shot twice, once in the shoulder and once in the face. Face in the face, but she's like greets him, doesn't she? Yeah, he's alive. Miraculously, he survives. Two minutes after being shot, Han regains consciousness, only to find his wife's lifeless body beside him. Mm. And in a state of sheer shock, he rushes out of the house, crying for help. This is the distress call that echoed into the operator's ear on the phone. Mm -hmm. In his frantic state, Han encounters a neighbor who attempts to help him. We would later discover that the bullet had pierced Han's eye and lodged itself into his brain. What? It's mental, Adam. Awful. Finally, when the police arrive at the scene, he is quickly whisked away to the hospital. And due to the severity of his condition, Han is immediately placed into a medically induced coma while the doctors like deliberate what the hell to do next with him. He's so lucky to be alive at that point it's yeah. gone through his eye and lodged it in the brain but that he's functioning at the moment that's it can you imagine would you even want to survive god knows what he must be going through like what he must have been thinking what that must have felt like waking up seeing your wife dead on the floor how awful i feel awful for them those yeah. poor people that is, yeah that is horrific so that night jennifer also ends up at the hospital while she isn't injured physically. She is deeply upset and distressed. Now, the police, knowing the importance of piecing together all the facts as quickly as possible, they ask her to share her story. So that night, she is taken to the police station where she undergoes a grueling interview lasting until the early hours of the morning. Now, during the interview, things start taking a strange turn, causing the police to begin raising some eyebrows. The first is that back at the hospital, Jennifer seemed genuinely surprised when she finds out that her father had survived and was now in a coma. She repeatedly quizzes the doctors, asking if it's possible that her father would regain consciousness. The odd part is her reaction. Instead of expressing relief or hope, she seems overly focused on the possibility of him waking up, which strikes the police as really unusual okay so the interviewers questioned her repeatedly and her unusual behavior is initially dismissed as shock however suspicion begins to arise at the conclusion of the interview when they ask her about her phone her response is surprising and confusing to the detective 
they have to explain to her that her phone could contain vital information that she might be unaware of. For instance, if her father or her mother had been followed or stalked in the last few days, the phone's location history could reveal this by comparing this data with security footage. They could then piece together like a clearer picture. Mm -hmm. Essentially, her phone could be like a crucial tool in this investigation. Yet Jennifer seems uncomfortable with this proposition. She begins to react really strangely, expressing her unease, and the police notice a sudden like shift in the room's atmosphere at so, her reluctance to like surrender her phone. Well, that's what I was just going to ask. She doesn't want to hand over her phone. No. no. I mean, the investigators tell her again, like, if you're innocent, then you have like nothing to fear, right? We're just trying to help. You want to help us, right? So after a bit of persuasion, she gives in and... Then Jennifer begins to question what they would be checking on her phone, who they'd be contacting, how far back they would look, and if they could retrieve like deleted messages. Now, eventually... Mm, that's a weird thing to be asking mm, at this time. You totally suspect her now. She seems totally guilty at this point, right? Yeah, get a burner phone. <laughs> that's right, exactly. Eventually, though, uh, she relented. She signed the form and then hands over her phone. So now Jennifer's home, of course, is now a crime scene. So she has to move in with family. Her brother, Felix, was at university, which is about an hour away. So he returns home to obviously be with family. Mm -hmm. Now, while at the hospital, her family notices that Jennifer is asking again more strange questions about Han's coma and his, of course, his chances of survival. She wants to know if the bullet in his brain could lead to infection or cause brain damage. And when the doctors reassure her that, listen, like the surgery was really successful, Mm -hmm. like you need to calm down. You don't need to worry. She then appears really annoyed and frustrated, which is so sus, isn't it? Yeah. She's up to something, right? She probably did this. Yeah. She's, I don't know to what extent at this point stage Mm. maybe it's gone wrong but uh, yeah what's her involvement we're gonna find out that's what we're here for (laughs) the compendium an assembly of fascinating and intriguing things okay with the tagline (laughs) at one point she asked her uncle for some change to use the payphone since the police had taken her phone he of course offers her his phone but she's like no no I'll, i'll use the payphone again another sus moment right yeah so what's she up to So let's dive into maybe Jennifer's background. Let's find out a little bit more about who she is because it will help us start to piece this case together just a little bit. Now, Jennifer was born in 1986 in Toronto. Jennifer's parents are Han and Bic, and they are political refugees from Vietnam who emigrated to Canada in the late 1970s. When they arrive, they secure jobs in a car factory and eventually they get married. Together, they have two children, Jennifer and Felix. Both Han and Beck work relentlessly to provide their kids with all the opportunities that they had moved to Canada to take advantage of. Now, despite working in a factory, Jennifer's parents do extremely well, right? Their strict financial discipline means that over time, they're living in a really impressive, sizable house that they own outright. Jennifer's father drives a fancy Mercedes Benz, which he is extremely proud of, and it's like this strange symbol of all his hard work and his success, right? Like you reach a certain age, you've retired, you've got a big lump sum of money or something like that, and then you decide to blow it as like a badge of honor. Likewise, her mother drives this Lexus. In addition, they have accumulated quite a substantial sum of money in the form of savings, which um, was going to be earmarked to support their children's college tuition and things like that. It seems like they've done pretty well for themselves since moving. Yeah. Now, in their quest to provide the best for their children, Jennifer's parents adopt a very strict parenting style, which lends to the term tiger parents. Tiger Ever heard parents. of that term? Do you know what a tiger parent is? No. What do you think it is? Mm, what I can think of is Tiger King. Um, I'm going to go with someone that's quite... So a tiger characteristics of being quite ruthless, um, hunter type, I don't know, quite not mean, but there's sort mm. of, I guess, um, a stealth, yeah, a ruthlessness about it. Sure. I mean, this term is typically associated with 
Asian parents. Right. Now, the thing is, though, it might seem like there might be some racist undertones in there, but actually a lot of these parents take on this term as something to be proud of Okay, because they take a lot of pride in pushing their kids to be the best. And like I said, a tiger parent, typically an Asian parent, often an immigrant or a first generation, who will go to great lengths to ensure that their children excel. They prioritize education and extracurricular activities and ensure a well-rounded education for their children. Mm -hmm. Now, typically, tiger parents expect nothing short of excellence and will often expect their kids to achieve top marks in class. To achieve this, they will often arrange for specialist tutors and place their children in fiercely competitive environments. Children are enrolled in various sports clubs and encouraged to play multiple instruments. In addition, they're pushed to undertake advanced level courses to supplement their primary and secondary education. So all those things that you that we know of from the stereotypes that we see on television, and it sounds like there's a term for it now, which mm-hmm. I never knew before. So you can imagine if you're growing up in this kind of environment, the amount of pressure and expectation that would be laid in upon you. You just know it would just be immense, right? Mm-hmm. That's why I asked to you earlier on, like, what's the biggest family pressure that was ever put on you? And you were like, oh, laying the table, being at dinner. Yeah. Eating <laughs> Ser- is a serious thing in my family. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah, I can't relate to that. I've never had any sort of educational pressures. Mm. Um, never. Although I think I've always been quite motivated myself and didn't really necessarily fortunate struggle too much of sort of education unfortunately it pains me to say you're quite well-rounded you're quite disciplined in your own right i had strict parents but they were not tiger parents anyway this is the exact kind of parents han and Bic were. To them, education was paramount and essential, and it was the one and only sole focus of Jennifer and Felix growing up. So Jennifer had been learning the piano since she was like four years old, so she became super skilled and talented as a pianist. So much so that she was at the level now where she was actually teaching others to play, which is incredible. Can you imagine getting to that level? I appreciate it. I was never like pushed like that. Mm. I feel like that's quite a, uh, that kind of hobby kind of thing yeah. um, and skills outside of education and things. I think that's quite nice. It just like gives me goosebumps when I see like those videos of people just in a coffee shop and they approach a piano and then they just start blaring out like Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony. I don't know. It's still Tchaikovsky. Yes, <laughs> that. <laughs> oh, um, I wish I'd play the piano. Yeah, but I don't know. It doesn't sound like it's perhaps done her too well this uh, extra parenting. Oh yeah, the story, let's carry on. (laughs) Also, Jennifer was encouraged to take up figure skating. She achieved numerous awards and was primed to eventually qualify for the Winter Olympics. Wow. But I know, right? Overachiever. I know. But a severe ligament issue in her knee meant that she couldn't compete any longer. Mm -hmm. So she had to give that up. Now, Jennifer recalls that during her primary school days, her schedule was just relentless. She would go to school all day, then go figure skating until like 10 p.m. Uh, and then when she got home, she would just do homework until like midnight. And that was like every day. How old was she at this age? So young teen, it'd be four year eight. Okay. Because that's quite a late schedule on a school night. Yeah, exactly. It's nine o'clock. You need to be in bed. So at the end of year eight, there's a graduation ceremony at Jennifer's school where valedictorians are typically recognized. Do you know what a valedictorian is? No. Well, a valedictorian is typically an accolade awarded to like US students who achieve the highest academic standard in their graduating class. Okay. And it's typically based on factors like grade point average, academic achievements, and sometimes other criteria like leadership or community involvement and things like that. Now, the valedictorian is often given the honor of delivering the speech during the graduation ceremony at the end of the year. And Jennifer was expected to be valedictorian and receive a bunch of rewards that year. But things don't actually go to plan. She doesn't secure valedictorian, nor does she win any awards. Oh. To make matters worse, when she receives her report, she realizes that her performance hasn't been great at all. What's she been doing? I know, right? 
This leaves her like completely shocked and also petrified to tell her parents, right? Knowing what we know about their parenting style. Sure. Because up until this point, she had excelled like literally in everything. She had always emerged as a top performer in her class and she finds it incredibly difficult to admit to her parents that she isn't the best at something. Mm -hmm. So she makes a decision not to tell them at all, which kickstarts a decade of lies that gets her into a deeper and deeper hole that she's just unable to escape from. So she's um, scared or nervous in telling her parents that she didn't get this accolade. Mm -hmm. And um, I... (laughs) I guess the pressure, even at that age, to like feel like I can't tell my parents I didn't do well. She's year eight, and maybe she was just doing too much for the, if she did so well up until this point, and mm-hmm. then just didn't do well. It could have just been like a fluke year or a fluke test or whatever it is. The thing is, though, that's what she thought. Okay, that it was a fluke year and that she would catch up next year. So, on her computer, she fakes her report card, right? Transforming all of her grades into straight A's. What grades does she get? Did we? She just got like averages, like B's and uh, B's and C's. So still yeah. decent marks. Yeah, but the expectations from her straight A's. She needed a valedictorian, so that would have been straight A's. Mm-hmm. She thinks that she'll catch up, obviously, in the next year, but she doesn't. And so this trend of faking her reports to keep up with the family's high expectations is just maintained. She becomes so good at faking them that her parents never suspect a thing, presenting her parents with fake report cards, certificates, accolades, and rewards, like pretty much every year of junior high and then towards the end of school. I guess it's like a slippery slope that she's done it once, she's fooled them, Mm -hmm. she fails another exam or doesn't do it as well, and she's like, I can just give them a fake report. That's it. Did she, I wonder if she then used that as a crutch or just relied upon that. I wonder if she tried as hard knowing that oh, worst comes to worst, I'll just fake the report. So the thing is, though, she, it's not like she's going out or anything, right? Mm. She, her parents are really controlling. So she is in the house every night. Mm. So what is she doing with that time? She's not then studying. So I did question whether or not it was she's just hit that academic wall. You know, mm. that's just the best that she can do. Mm-hmm. And it probably snuck up on her, but she just wasn't able to keep up because it's not like she's going out and she's partying and stuff. She's got no freedom. The thing at this time is that she also really enjoys music and she is considering a career in music. Remember, she's already like really super talented anyway, but her dad insists that is not an option for her. He wants her to become a pharmacist. And so he's going to make sure that's exactly what she becomes. She had zero freedom or the ability to do anything else other than academics at all. Her friends at the time remember that she was never allowed to go to sleepovers ever. Her parents would always drop her off and then pick her up from school. So essentially her entire childhood was like this academic prison cell in Mm. her parents' home, which is just really sad, right? Yeah. But again, reinforcing this idea that if she is not doing well and she's at home all the time then maybe she has hit just that academic wall where she's just reached her peak maybe she needed more in her life other than that to excel do you think that's a thing i think you need balance i don't think you can just do one thing a hundred percent and be great at it all the time without having breaks and stuff possibly yeah i don't know i guess we can't really um imagine maybe the pressure because it feels a bit silly like really you're you're Mm. doing that but never had that pressure from anyone Mm mm-hmm to always exceed expectations yeah and um yeah maybe that that, i imagine that could be quite overwhelming i think so as well poor girl now around 16 years old jennifer gets a secret boyfriend his name is daniel wong so she has time for a boyfriend well they meet on a music trip to europe which is where they become a couple So a secret romantic fling with Daniel Wong begins, which she 100% has to keep hidden from her parents. Mm -hmm. Um, In the 12th grade, she receives an early acceptance into Rayston University. The plan is to spend a few years there and then transfer to the University of Toronto to study pharmacology. 
However, things again don't go as planned when she just fails calculus, which is like maths in America, mm-hmm. causing Rayston University to rescind her offer. Obviously, if we're going by what happened in year eight, there is just no way that she can possibly tell her parents this either, right? Mm-hmm. So she tells her parents that she's off to university and she keeps up the charade for four years. Four, so she goes and pretends she's at university. Mm-hmm. To make things worse, because she failed calculus, not only did she fail to get into university, but she also never graduated from high school. Really? It's mental, Adam. So I'm going to say that as if I go, oh, that's easy. But still, like, this is someone that had quite a bright, like, upbringing or, you know. Back- yeah. But that's crazy that you would lie to your parents about not graduating high school. So what does she do for those four years? She spends her days going to cafes, visiting public libraries, and leaving the house with a backpack, pretend to go to class. And every day, she's just basically just living a lie. She's just not going to university. Mm-hmm. At this point, she is still with Daniel. So they have a long-term relationship. Now, Daniel didn't do amazing at school either. He does graduate from high school and goes off to study mechanical engineering, but nothing really comes of this. He doesn't really have a clear direction for his life and is involved in some questionable activities like selling drugs and basic petty crime and things like that. He does work as a manager at a pizza restaurant, but it's nothing that he plans on really pursuing. To him, it's just a way to earn a bit of money. And their relationship at this time is still very secret from their parents. They have no clue. And in order to spend time together, Jennifer persuades her parents to let her stay at a friend's house for a few nights each week, which she claims is to avoid having to commute to university campus on those days. But the truth is that she was literally living with Daniel and his family. Living a whole nother life, a whole double life. That makes sense because you mentioned that she would like put on her backpack. And I was thinking she's going away to university, which is further afield. But she's actually, the plan was she'd live at home and go to university. So every day she's doing that. Mm. Now she's living with her boyfriend's parents or, you know, for a few days a week. Mm -hmm. So obviously there is the question of the tuition fees. Who's paying for university? She actually tells her parents that she receives a scholarship. She creates all these fake forms to prove um, that she got in on the scholarship and they just buy it. But I think she's missed a trick. If she's going to go to these lengths to be this deceitful, why did she not fake the forms and get her parents to pay for the university fees? But then you probably would have to like pay to a certain person or a bank or something like that. So Set up a bank account and just go, you don't need to see the name of it. You just Mm. need the account numbers, right? Maybe she didn't think that. Maybe she thought, maybe. oh, maybe maybe she didn't want to rinse her money. Possibly, her yeah. Maybe she has good intentions throughout all of this as well. Maybe she still thinks she's going to catch up. <laughs> she's, well, she still needs to graduate high school. God. So the original plan was for her to enroll into pharmacology school after Raisden. So a couple of years go by and time is up, right? She's not graduated high school. She hasn't been to university. So what is she going to do now? Well, she tells her parents that she has been accepted into the most prestigious pharmacology program in the country at the University of Toronto. And that she'll be transferring there after Rayston. And again, to make it seem believable, she forges all these documents claiming that she got accepted under yet another scholarship. And so at the end of every semester and at the end of every year, again, she fakes her grades to continue propping up this lie that just keeps getting bigger and bigger. The pressure she must be feeling is just insane. It's making me feel quite anxious. Every day you wake up, your life is a lie. Every day you wake up, this could come crashing down. What kind of feeling must that feel like? like what's she going to do? Like pretend that she's a, like a pharmacist when she's 35 or something. Also... Her father's really invested in her success, right? So he wants to keep tabs on her progress. As a result, she needs to step up her game to make sure she can keep this lie going. She buys all the required textbooks for her pharmacology course and spends all of her spare time meticulously taking notes 
from textbooks to make it seem like she's genuinely studying pharmacology. The thing is, though, she's going through all these lengths to go through all of this. Why can't she just go to college? Yeah. Or leave, go and study at a, like, obviously graduate and then go study at maybe a college that isn't as renowned, but still get the qualification. And then you're just lying that you didn't go to as good a university or anything. Exactly. What is this girl thinking? It's Mm. weird. It's just baffling. I mean, with like I said, with the effort that she appears to be putting in, I just don't understand why she just doesn't get herself sorted and go to university. So just none of it makes sense at all. So she's given up already. Yeah. So her parents believe she's doing really well. Well, but, why wouldn't they? But when it comes time for her to finish her course and become a pharmacist, her parents are expecting to watch her, of course, graduate. She explains to her parents that the graduating class is so large that there's only enough tickets for one per student. And so she assumes that her parents wouldn't want to go to the graduation ceremony without each other. Mm -hmm. So she tells them that she gave her ticket to a friend. So they're obviously upset. But later, she brings home a graduation cap and a physical copy of her diploma, which she purchases for $500. And her parents are like super proud, but they want to see pictures. So she tells them that all the pictures are on her friend's camera, but her friend is just left to go traveling around the world and that she will get them the photos when they return. She's just kicking this can down the road, right? It's horrendous. So it is clear that she now has to find a job as an actual real-life pharmacist. She tells her parents that she's found a position in a hospital where she used to volunteer during her student days this way she doesn't have to go through the hassle of pretending to write up cvs apply for jobs and fake that she's going to a bunch of interviews right so this is like a majorly convenient lie for Mm -hmm. her to maintain but her parents are like really confused because they're usually aware of her whereabouts at all times Mm -hmm. and she's never mentioned anything about volunteering like ever Right. And they find it odd that they've never seen her uniform or her hospital ID or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So this is a girl that's like gone through these great lengths to prop up these lies, buying these textbooks and everything. But she doesn't buy or forge or acquire any uniforms or badges mm-hmm. or an official document. I wonder if she's starting to get a bit lax, do you think? Possibly. Maybe with the amount of lies that her parents have bought, like, bought into. Mm -hmm. Maybe she just thinks, oh, they'll they'll buy that. So something triggers in her dad to start getting suspicious. So one day, her mum is getting ready to drop her off at the hospital, and her dad tells the mum, Bic, that instead of dropping her off at the front entrance, to follow Jennifer inside to see where she goes. So her mum does what she is told. But while her mum is executing her plan, Jennifer realizes that she's been followed. So she quickly enters the hospital and hides in a stairwell where she literally spends the entire day because she's absolutely terrified that her parents will be waiting outside if she comes out. Meanwhile, Jennifer's mum is searching the entire hospital. (laughs) She's asking people if they know someone named Jennifer Pan. She's going to all the different departments. But everyone tells her that no one by that name works at the hospital. Oh, no. (laughs) That night, it's one of the nights that Jennifer usually stays at her girlfriend's place. Mm -hmm. So the next morning, her parents call this girlfriend up and ask her to tell Jennifer to come home because they really need to talk to her. Okay. The girlfriend is confused. And she says, what are you talking about? She's not here. And then they discover that for the last three years, Jennifer has not been staying at a friend's house like she's been telling her parents this whole time. Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer. They are furious. Why? I just don't understand. She's wasted three years doing F all. Yeah, hanging out with Daniel. Now she deserves this. Do you think? (laughs) Well, a little bit. Yeah, I felt sorry for now, but now I think she's just... I don't know. She's, I don't understand it. I don't get it. Do you think something is wrong with her? All of her effort is just lying and mm. covering up and having an easy time. She'd rather go spend a few nights a week at her boyfriend's house mm. and do probably not a lot. Maybe she could use that time to actually, okay, I'm not going to be a actually, pharmacist, but I'm going to go and do something else with my life. Yeah. 
That is the bit I don't understand. So later that day, Jennifer finally comes home and her parents are sat there waiting. They confront her and everything starts to unravel. Jennifer admits that she was actually staying with Daniel, who has been her secret boyfriend for eight years. Eight years at this point. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, they met when they were 16. So she's like 24 or something. Mm -hmm. Her parents knew that she was dating him in high school for a very short period of time. But they thought they put a stop to that because they forbade her from seeing him. And they thought that was just the end of it. They then confront her about there being no record of her ever working or even volunteering at the hospital. So she comes clean. She admits that she's not a pharmacist and that she didn't finish pharmacology school. In fact, she didn't complete university or even graduate from high school. Her dad goes absolutely apeshit at this. He's about to kick her out and completely disown her, but her mum persuades him to let her stay. Mm -hmm. Essentially, her parents convince themselves that it's all Daniel's fault. They believe that Daniel had led her in the wrong direction. And by the way, remember, she's 24 years old at this point. People that know her say she behaves more like a 15 year old and as a result so many people just treat her accordingly so that's another thing that makes me think is she developmentally challenged as she hit that academic wall does she stop at the age of 15 is that as far as she can progress so people think she acts like a 15 year old when she's 24 or mm. the age now interesting i guess do you think that if she's had such a sheltered life would she perhaps get burnt out by that and gone i don't really care about that anymore maybe now her parents give her an ultimatum they tell her that she can stay if she promises to never see Daniel ever again, or she can leave, but they will never see her family again. Oh, well, that's quite hard. So Jennifer chooses to stay. Okay. So life continues. She begins to piece together her life after lying for literally over a decade, but she really starts to resent how limited her life has now become. I mean, she had no freedom before, but now she's essentially a prisoner. Her parents take away her phone and her computer And she can only go out to attend classes which will help her graduate high school or when she's attending like piano classes. Mm -hmm. Basically, her mom drops her off. She waits in the car for her to finish and then they drive straight home. And Jennifer is literally never alone. Someone is always, always, always watching her. It's like she's chaperoned everywhere. Her mom is a little bit more understanding than her dad. So... She secretly tells her where her phone is hidden so she can make like secret phone calls to her friends and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. However, Daniel at this time is mega frustrated with the situation. They're still together. Mm -hmm. He says that he is tired of how she's been treated and that he never gets to see her anymore. He's like, listen, Jennifer, we're adults now, but it feels like I'm dating a literal teenager Mm -hmm. because you're never allowed to leave the house. And so... He just decides to end the relationship and tells Jennifer that he has fallen in love with another girl. This sends Jennifer over the edge because he is literally the only person who technically knows her Mm -hmm. the best, like throughout all the lies and everything. So she's naturally really heartbroken. So consequently, she starts making up all these bullshit lies. For example, she tells him that a group of men broke into a house and gang raped her. Why would she lie about that? That's awful. It's awful. That's like clear attention seeking. Now I'm with you with this whole, there's definitely something, um, I think an illness or something in terms of her sanity, I Mm -hmm. feel, at this stage. Well, after this incident, she tells Daniel that she desperately needs him to come and take care of her during obviously this difficult time. She also tells Daniel that someone sent a bullet in the mail and that she suspects that both the men who raped her and the bullet were sent by her new girlfriend, who is, like, evil and jealous of, like, their close relationship. Right. And again, that just kind of reinforces that idea that you just said, right? Mm. Is she all okay up there? Not in the right state of mind. What is odd is instead of just cutting off all ties, Daniel continues to maintain some level of connection. But he is super kind of distant and detached in their conversations he clearly doesn't care for her in the same way that he did before but he's just for some reason he's sort of stringing her along mm-hmm. and that's when she tells him that her parents both have a life insurance policy she explains that these policies were taken out to protect obviously herself and her brother in case something bad happens to her parents mm-hmm. so if 
her parents were to pass away, they would be there would be money available for her and her brother's education and anything else that they needed. She calculates that combined with their assets and their life insurance money, she and her brother would each receive a little over half a million dollars. Of, nice sum. Of course, this really grabs the attention of Daniel all of a sudden. And she notices this. And so she becomes convinced that if she had half a million dollars and freedom from her parents, then Daniel would leave his girlfriend and come back to her. As what could re- go wrong? I mean, she's not very bright at this moment, so we know exactly what's going <laughs> to yeah. go wrong. As a result, she starts discussing the idea of having her parents killed. And Daniel's response is like, yeah, I mean, why not? I mean, he sounds like a knob. He is a knob. So through his connections in the kind of the shady world of drug dealing, he tells her that he knows someone who might be willing to do it. How does he know that? I don't know anyone that can kill anyone. You're obviously not hanging around with the right people. Or the wrong people. No way, the right people. In the this right, case, wrong the people. right people. Yeah. <laughs> I've got like, Adam, I've got like two people on speed dial mm. that can help me out. You watch it. So they approach this guy. <laughs> so I don't actually have two people on speed dial. Don't look so concerned. Eh. So they approach this guy and they come to an agreement that Jennifer will pay $10,000 for each parent that he kills and that she will give him the money, the life insurance money, once she gets the payout. Mm -hmm. This guy also recruits two other people to help and the plan is to make it appear as if the murder was a home robbery that goes wrong. Uh, Okay. So this brings us pretty much up to the point of the crime. The police investigate Jennifer and they discover that she has lied about actually everything. Her whole half of her life. Entire life. They also now know that she is a pathological liar. Mm -hmm. The police also find out that her parents have kept her essentially a prisoner in her own home ever since they learned about the lies. Mm -hmm. So they start seeing this as a pretty solid motive for calling the hit on her parents. And so the police decide to focus on her really intently. They bring her in for a second interview, Mm -hmm. a few days after, obviously, the initial one. During this interview, they start to question her really intensely. What is amazing is that all of these interviews are all recorded, and they are fascinating. So there's this YouTube channel called JCS Criminal Psychology who commentates over, like, high-profile police interviews, and he'll talk you through the suspect's body language, their demeanor, He'll discuss the various techniques employed by the detectives during the interview, um, like laying out the room in a specific way to make the suspect feel like confident or insecure or intimidated. Really? Yeah, all these different tactics. They play like good cop, bad cop to try and win trust and bargain in like really subtle ways. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating. I love the channel. Mm-hmm. Or they'll like leave the room and leave the suspect alone for hours and hours to try and kind of like wear them down. So I did hear something that Canadian police, I think US police, are allowed to also lie to a suspect if they're trying to catch them out. Well, to a certain extent, there are. When I was watching this interview, there are there were some subtle maneuvers that I saw a couple of detectives use in the third interview, Mm -hmm. where they just led her to believe that they had way more evidence than. They actually had. So they could mis- misleading her a little bit. Yeah. They even at one point said like, we, you need to understand that we have loads of resources at our disposal. Mm. For example, we have satellite cameras that can almost look down at a house like an x-ray and we can see the people that are in the house and where they're moving. And he used that during the third interview to really spook her, to make her believe that he knew what had happened that night. Really? Yeah. Do, so, can, is, can they? Do they have that? No. Oh no! But they—that's a technically that's possible, but obviously they don't have that. No, it's not possible. What? You can't do an X-ray on someone's house from space. Oh no! So not an X-ray, like a oh, no, but like heat map, can't they? They can see bodies within a house. They can. Uh, they can do, but they're saying from space. From space, they have it yeah. on her house. Yeah. Yeah. I think, like if an aeroplane flies over, they can norm. But normally, it's. They can't. They can do that if you have like a cannabis farm mm-hmm. in your house in your loft because you're using all these heaters and etc. And there's loads of electricity going through it mm-hmm. and whatever. So they could probably pick up on things like that. But they also use other tactics. If it's winter and they're driving through a neighborhood and all the roofs have got snow on them, but one of them doesn't, mm-hmm. they go, okay, clearly Something's a cannabis up. farm up there. Yeah, yeah. 
But yeah, that's interesting that they could do that because I'm pretty sure in the UK you're not allowed. They're not allowed. I don't to do know that. how it works in the UK, hmm. but it didn't sound like these guys in these interviews were doing anything ruthless. Do you know what I mean? It sounded quite. They were quite respectable hmm. a lot of the time. It's really fascinating. Check it out. We'll link to those YouTube videos in the show notes where you can watch all three of Jennifer's interviews. So detectives begin to ask her to describe the events from their night once again. She starts contradicting herself from the very beginning. For instance, in her first statement, she says that she never went downstairs. Now she says she was taken downstairs by the intruders and then later tied up to the banister upstairs. She also says that she never heard the intruders speak, yet in the next breath, she said that they were demanding money from her mother and pushing her down onto the sofa. Detectives make a point of pointing out some of these contradictions, which makes her extremely nervous when they do point it out. So she starts treating the questions like they're like test questions, which she hasn't studied for. And so she's extremely cautious and extremely deliberate in the way that she answers all of the questions. Right. Interestingly, some occasions where she contradicts herself, detectives just deliberately like let this slide. They don't like bring this to the to her mm-hmm. attention. And we see kind of the clear relief on her face when she answers these questions and they just go, okay, yep. Because she thinks that she's answered it correctly, right? Yeah. This is obviously a technique that detectives employ to try and trap her later mm-hmm. in order to make her lose track of what she said. Because yeah. now they've let this one slide, but then they'll pick it up next time because she's yeah. remembered that. And they'll be like, but actually in your first one, you've said this. And then she starts to question about what she's actually said. Yeah really fascinating they also start questioning how she managed to get her phone out of her pocket and dial 911 if she was tied up to the banister i did wonder that when you said that Mm. they ask her explain to us how you made the call when your hands were tied they try to get her to demonstrate this in the interview room but she's obviously at first she's reluctant she's like can't i just tell you uh, but they insist that she gets up and shows him. And by a stroke of luck, right, the way that she maneuvers her body, she's able to do it first time. Mm-hmm. She also states that when she discovers her dad was alive, she then dialed 911, which according to the recording of the 911 call, that's not true. She actually realizes that her father is alive halfway through the call. Yeah. That's a big thing to remember, right? Or yeah. to forget or to get wrong. I mean, I've, the first time I've heard this story and I remembered that bit. By the end of the interview, detectives are wildly suspicious. But ultimately, the reality is they just don't have enough evidence to physically charge her. Mm-hmm. But then her dad wakes up from the coma. <gasps> mm-hmm. dun, dun, dun. Didn't see that happening, did you, Jennifer? No. When her dad wakes up, he tells his family that he needs to speak to the police Straight away. So the police come to his hospital room. He explains to them that on the night when Bick and him was tied up, he saw Jennifer calmly walking around with the intruders, talking to them as if they were friends. What a bitch. She is horrible. The reason why he ran from the house screaming when he woke up in the basement was because he knew that she was involved and he was trying to escape. Oh, okay. Yeah, not because he had a bullet in his head and that he was like losing kind of his marbles. Yeah. He knew that she was involved and they put him in a damn coma. (laughs) That's mental. It's it's weird how he didn't have a chance to like tell someone that because they put him in a coma. Did they do that when he got to hospital? I think by when he got to hospital, they then put him to the coma because like a a thought head injury. Between that point and the hospital, he's like, it was my daughter. Don't let her near me. Maybe he did say that. Maybe they just didn't take it. Seriously? Yeah, Yeah. that's the only thing I could think of. Like, for them, oh, like, shh, 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 shh. You go to sleep now. We're taking care of you. You got a bullet in your brain. You're not speaking sense. Poor guy. He also tells police that he does not want to see Jennifer or for her to visit the hospital under any circumstances. However, she discovers that he is woken up, so she quietly enters the room. She tells him that she's got accepted into university and asks him for $1,200. What? I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Finally the, did it. <laughs> the audacity. He's just lost his wife, been in a coma, and she's like, I can have some money, Dad. Mm. What a bitch. Yeah. Now. After her dad tells the police about her sneaking into his room, the police bring Jennifer in for a third interview. And 
this interview is the one that breaks her. Again, they intensely question her using all the interrogation techniques to try and get her to confess, mm -hmm. guarding her down paths where she's contradicted herself. And it reaches a point where they say, Jennifer, basically, we know you did this. Just admit it. Eventually, she confessed to saying, yes, I did organize for people to come to the house, but they weren't supposed to kill my parents. They were supposed to kill me. Oh my major God. eye roll there from you she is like oh she's so frustrating this woman who i mean if you wanted to kill yourself <laughs> there are other means not that i'm going to talk about that but why did she think this was a good way of well she claims that she wants to end her own life but she didn't want to bring shame on her family by killing herself so she planned to make it look like a murder the police are like Seriously, this makes zero sense. They ask her, why did they only shoot your parents and then not you? So apparently, when she told them that she didn't want to go through with it anymore, they get really mad and decide to come to the house anyway and kill her parents as punishment. But by this point, the police already had enough. So by the end of the third interview, they arrest her. Daniel, who helped her plan it, also gets arrested along with the three guys who actually committed the actual crime. So they got her. Mm -hmm. They all are declared guilty of murder, attempted murder, and conspiracy to commit murder. They receive a life sentence in prison, uh, but after 25 years, they might be eligible for parole. For Jennifer, that would be 2035 when she turns 49. However, it's unlikely that she will be granted parole because to be considered for parole you have to at least accept some responsibility for what you did and show some kind of remorse. Mm -hmm. But Jennifer still maintains to this day that it was a bizarre suicide attempt that went wrong. God. She still will not admit the truth. She refuses to admit the truth. But all the other people that were involved have said, yeah, Jennifer basically mm -hmm. told us. So how does she think? It's maddening, I, I, isn't it? Yeah, she's got she's in a fruit loop really is during her trial jennifer's father writes a statement about how the crime has affected him which they read out during sentencing and it's really sad in it he says i hope that she can become a good and honest person as she grows up oh. it's really sad that must be awful he's lost his wife he should be I wonder if he still loves her in some way. I don't know. I don't think he's... Well, the thing is, though, her father and her brother request the judge to issue a no-contact order, oh, right. meaning that Jennifer can never contact them ever again. And Jennifer has the absolute audacity to oppose this. <laughs> but the judge is like, lol, no, and then grants the request <laughs> prohibiting Jennifer from ever contacting her father or brother ever again. Poor people. Yeah. Can you imagine what the brother... I know we didn't talk about Felix at all, but can you imagine what he must be going through? Because mm, he's lost his mum and his sister, essentially. He went to university. <laughs> yeah. He, he can do it. Um, Why can't you do it? I mean, they do sound like overbearing and it does sound horrible growing mm -hmm. up, but what she's done is just inexcusable. It really is, yeah. So the story only really gained popularity when a journalist who attended the same school as Jennifer, who had also come from like an Asian family, wrote an article about her. The journalist shared a little bit of her perspective mm -hmm. as someone who was experienced, who had experienced a similar upbringing with like tiger parents. Mm -hmm. And so this is the first time people began to realize that strict parenting may have driven Jennifer to the point of madness. Not to say that strict parenting does that because there are millions of other people like you who are forced to set the table at night who didn't end up murdering your parents. No. But yeah. And that is the story of Jennifer Pan. Jennifer Pan. <laughs> Question. If their family had stayed in Vietnam, mm -hmm. Um, with all the other, I guess, families that have gave that same sort of pressure, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Do you think that would have... Do you think they would have had the same pressure if they stayed in Vietnam? Well, this, I don't think so. This is what, yeah. If they'd mm. stayed in Vietnam, they wouldn't have potentially had that type of personality. Yeah. So and therefore, she might have... Been... They never would have left and therefore maybe hadn't been quite yeah, as strict. I'm with you. But I think you're right. They could have been just as strict. Mm. So, that concludes our story for today. 
No, that was a that was a good one. We hope you've enjoyed it, and we appreciate you being part of the Compendium family. Um, you can, of course, reach out to us on Instagram at the Compendium Podcast, or you can reach out to us with suggestions or questions at the Compendium Pod at gmail.com. And I guess that's it. Have you got anything else that you want to say? No, that's it. Thank you, Kyle. Aww. Thank you for that podcast. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's all I ask for. I do this for the thanks. <laughs> Until next week. Until next week. See ya. Thank you.